Hey guys, today I will share with you a fun surprise system that if you want to avoid the Nimso Indian that arises after knight c3 bishop b4 and you want to get an original position with not too much fury, then I have a feeling you're really going to like this game that we see here between Nihal Sarin beating our Anish Giri. This was from the uh, the chess.com global championship uh, semi-finals, if I remember it correctly, where with this win there, he played the final against Wesley So. Wesley So went on to win the whole tile over Nihal in a pretty fun match. And actually also in that match, Nihal was playing this move, Bishop F4, as a sort of anti-Nimso. And the first time I really heard about this move was when I saw that modern chess were promoting a uh, a course by, or a PGN course by Deverin Kolyasovic, were recommending this Bishop F or Annie Nim, so... But something I never really took all that seriously, to be honest, because I just thought, okay, Black just plays D5, and, you know, what's sort of the point, in a way? Like, if Black just goes C5, then Bishop F4 looks a little bit too early as such. Well, Nihal had something to say about that, but before I get into that, I do also want to point out that if Black doesn't play D5, then Bishop here is actually a little bit of an annoying move. Like, let's say if Black goes Bishop B4, saying, well... You're going to transpose to a Nimzo anyway. Uh, nah, -uh. we go knight to d2, and you know, suddenly the bishop could be a little bit misplaced on b4 as such. You know, we can go a3 and try to pick up the the bishop pair. Now, the computer says position is still quite playable for Black, but it's certainly clear that compared to a Nimzo, this is not going to be quite as flexible uh, in that sense. Like, for example, if Black goes c5, then you know you can definitely you know, take take e3, and I mean you've got a a position where you've got pretty easy piece play and quite clear plans in the middle game, where Black will probably likely go for some sort of, you know, hedgehog-style structure, but even then, White's still going to have a little something to work with. Uh, also, if they do play the move, let's say, C5, that, you know, a Benoni player might play. Um, actually, I saw this move played in a game in round two, I believe, of the Bangkok Chess Open between two Australian players, uh, you know, Emma Gu, uh, one of Australia's top female players playing against Grandmaster David Smurden as black. And yeah, in that game, you know, white got a very nice advantage out of the opening. You know, kind of the idea is after takes, takes. If black does play it like a normal Benoni, well, we can kind of move order him into this Knight F3 line, which I actually covered in a YouTube video. I think it was called, like, don't play this opening against D4, 1D4, if I remember correctly. A very nice win by another Australian player, Bobby Cheng, in the, uh, in the same tournament. Um, I forgot exactly how the Smurden game went. I think he might have gone B5 or, or something here, but, you know, White's still doing quite well. Like, you can go Knight C3, or indeed even taking the pawn is, is probably also viable. But yeah, I mean, this position is also going to be quite nice for White. Where compared to a Blumenfeld, you could definitely make the argument that Bishop F4 is at least not weaker than the move Knight F3 for White. Um, and if Black does decide to play it like a Queen's Indian with B6... Well, then, so the argument is that you have a slightly improved version of a Queen's Indian with A3 and Knight C3, because uh, to give a little bit of context, actually, a line I have a little bit of a soft spot for against the Queen's Indian is this modern approach of playing A3 and then playing the move Bishop to F4, where in this way you're sort of, much like in this Nihal Giri game, actually, you're sort of taking some of the sting out of the normal main line of D5, like, normally you get this position with the knight on c3 instead of the bishop on f4, and that line's thought to be quite fine for black. But here you can go bishop g3 and sort of kick their knight away with e4 in one go, and that's going to give white a little bit of an edge to work with. So you're kind of aiming for a similar sort of thing here with knight c3, where, okay, I suppose one difference here is that you know, black could play d5, and, you know, this sort of Grunfeld or semi tariff style move does tend to be a little bit more effective when you've got the knight, you know, on c3 to trade off. But white can also beat black to the punch with knight d5, and you know, I would say that white does have, a, you know, a little edge to work with in this case after just thinking where I want to play, like, e3 or knight f3 first. You know, maybe it doesn't actually really matter, but let's say e3, and you know, definitely a position like this where, let's say, bishop g3, knight f3 would be quite thematic. It actually has a very London-esque kind of feel to it, but where, you know, black's committed to his setup, and Okay, if black goes like knight d7, takes c5, h6, he's probably doing fine, but it's a fresh position where we can definitely try to set black some practical problems, and you know, our moves are, are pretty obvious as well from from white's point of view. I know I did a little bit of an arrow spam, but I think you know you can uh, you can follow along. By the way, if you are enjoying this video, do make sure to subscribe to the channel. 
Uh, and if you're a real overachiever, ding the notification bell to, you know, make your chess improvement as done for you as possible. What I mean by that is all you have to do is, you know, watch your training videos each day and you'll just magically become a stronger chess player. Um, well, because I'm doing these videos each day, at least at the time of the recording. Anyway, up to d5, white plays the move, c takes d5. Um, like I said, if, you know, e3, black will go c5, and when black is able to play very directly in the center, then maybe you would prefer to play a move other than bishop f4. Because basically you've transposed into a panel of Botfinnick, but where you would have rather played the move knight f3 rather than bishop f4 as white. So, in that case, you get a little bit move order, and this was kind of the reason why I never really took Bishop F4 all that seriously as white until very recently. Uh, but CD5 was Nihal's idea. Like, if black goes ED5, then you actually get a pretty nice sort of exchange QGD where, you know, the bishop might seem worse on G5 and F4, but actually, if you're able to kind of complete your setup, then you're actually going to have a very nice advantage. There's a line in the Queen's Gambit declined exchange where you actually play Bishop F4 voluntarily, and you lose a tempo, but you're still a little bit better with this very strong Bishop on the diagonal. Of course, yeah, Black can play Bishop D6 in one go, so they kind of get the tempo back as well. But yeah, definitely, you know, you can play in the simplest level, something like take, take, Knight F3, or maybe Bishop D3 is more precise, actually, just not giving Bishop F5. I mean, yeah, you, can, you know, you can play, like, it's a... Uh, Fresh position where you can definitely you know, outplay the opponent from here. Uh, the computer is saying the best bet is to go b6, c5 and try to get some hanging pawns type position. But I would be pretty happy to get this as white personally. Uh, so this is why Geary plays the move knight d5 in the game. And after bishop g3 we see white's idea that he just wants to go for something like e4 and knight c3 and just totally dominate the center. Uh, if black were to play a move such as bishop d6, for example, then, okay, apparently you can even do better than e4 here, that you can just play, like, knight to f3, and kind of, you know, get a few pieces developed first, and then play the move e4 later. Um, definitely your position, like, uh, like this, for example, is, you know, it's an absolute dream come true for white, you know, knight c3, and we have the central space, and our pieces are just all very, very well placed in the structure. So this is why Geary plays c5. It's really the move black needs to play if he does not want to be worse out of the opening. But now e4, knight to f6, and knight d2 is the ideal that Nihal had prepared for this uh, this tournament. With the point being that, yeah, we're sacrificing the pawn and black does indeed take it in the game. But we get to go e5 and we get, you know, a nice lead in development and some, you know, long-term attacking chances. It's kind of like an Alapin Sicilian, actually, but sort of an Alapin where... You know, Black maybe has the extra pawn, but the pawn also maybe gets in the way of some of his counterplay on the king side. It's actually very similar to a line of the Vienna, and I know it's a little bit of a tangent, but I think it'll be quite important for understanding why White plays this way to, to go into it. So let's say, like, in the Vienna, we have, you know, dc4, e4, bishop b4, and instead, like, the main line of c5, let's say that Black goes h6 and just wants to pick up that bishop pair, at the cost of some suffering. Well, in this case, after c5, castle, cd4, in this position here after queen d8, it's actually best not to play knight takes d4, despite what my engine is saying at a low depth. It's actually better to go knight to e4 and just play for this very long-term attack, where you kind of just use your lead in development to build up an attack on the black king, and it's a position that probably objectively is fine for black, but practically is actually quite unpleasant to, to defend. And that's kind of what Nikhal is going for here, like a very similar kind of position, in fact. Um, also, I should point out, by the way, that the move Queen d4 is actually probably the best move for Black, and it's the move that Wesley So played in his game against uh, Giri, uh, against Nihal, I should say, in the finals. Um, it's sort of interesting, actually, because, yeah, this position only occurred in one game in the lead chess database, actually, after knight d2. Um, but okay, Queen d4, yeah, was played in the uh, in the so game, and after this queen d8, yeah, you know, I can still play the same way, like e5, where even though Wesley so did go on to win this game against Nihal, I don't think it was because of the opening. You know, white will go castles, queen e2, probably knight e4. You know, maybe you could go a4, knight c4 in some positions. Like if they go a6, like you could, for example, play a4 and secure c4 for the knight. But in reality, I would probably just let them go b5 because I just don't care. Maybe it's more of a stylistic preference, but. Anyway, 
In either case, White is going to have good compensation for the pawn, you know, castle, castle, and definitely uh, having the d6 square and having some extra space and attacking chance against the king means, yeah, White will ultimately have quite decent compensation here. Uh, well, the injury is giving 0, 0, 0 if you want the official verdict. And that's the way else I would recommend black plays. Like, you should go queen d4 and, you know, develop normally. Just play the way Wesley so did and you'll probably be okay. But after cd4, e5, so this is how, you know, the Nihal Giri game played out. A3. Uh, knight d7 is a little bit odd. I think that it's probably better just to develop normally. Say, bishop e7, bishop d3, castles and... You know, I could play a conventional move like castles and you know, have pretty typical compensation, but I have a feeling maybe Nihal was going to play something like h4 here and try again some knight g5, and you know, it'd be quite a nice creative way to attack. Definitely it feels like a very you know, neural network engine, you know, Layla 0, Alpha 0 style of attack by white to you know use the h-pawn in this dynamic fashion. Anyway, it's something you can explore for yourself if you're so inclined, but after knight d7, I think this is a little bit too slow. After knight f5, bishop f4, it's it's not entirely obvious what the knight is really doing on h f5. And after bishop e7, I think the most natural move here would just be to play h4. By the way, we'll see this game is actually really beautiful that Nihal wins with some very nice combinations at the end. But I like h4 because one thing is that black is not actually threatening to take the pawn. Because after take, take, we have queen to g4 and you know, we're threatening both the bishop and the pawn. And if they do defend both of them at once... Very nice thematic tactical blow is rook h4. We can play knight to e4 in the worst case, and like with the knight coming as beautiful d6 outpost, or even f6 depending on how they play it, and you're just coming in on the dark squares, like black is completely toast at this point, at least from the, the practical point of view, probably objectively as well. White in the game played g4, which I think is not quite as good, but it's not terrible either. I mean, it's a move you'll often see. In the advanced French, like if you have the white pawn on d4 and black pawn on d5, you'll often see why I play g4 at some moment just to negate the pressure on d4. It's a somewhat similar idea here where, you know, the bishop instead of the queen had to come to h4, which is not quite as nice. Uh, but from an objective point of view, this position is probably kind of okay for black if he plays it correctly. Um, you know, computer points out a really wild idea of playing f6 and, you know, basically giving back the pawn, but, you know, trying to get back some control and, you know, get rid of this annoying bishop. Okay, it's a bit of a computerish line, definitely very unclear. But in the game, black plays bishop e7, which is honestly the more normal move, queen e2. So white is not yet deciding where he wants to put his king, but now he goes h4 saying, well, we're going to keep the king in the center or eventually castle queenside. And definitely you know, the idea of putting the fawn pawn h6 does look quite scary, but I do think that if black, you know, cold-bloodedly just plays like a4, Queen b6 and castles long. Yeah, that does get the king out of the firing zone. Actually, maybe that's not entirely true. The king would still be a bit weak, but you know, something like this is probably the right way to play it, like h6, g6. And yeah, I mean, white definitely still has some good compensation. Like the pawn are definitely constricting black quite a lot, but it's also not like losing for black either, let's say, in a, in a position like this. You know, it's still a, a game of chess. Uh, the position goes on. Probably is white, you're going to go like bishop g5 and try to get the queen to f6, but of course black will get to make moves as well. In the game, black goes h5, which maybe from a human perspective is quite natural, trying to fight back on the king's side, but because black has not developed his queen side properly, it means the opening of the position is going to favor white with better developed pieces. Uh, one point, by the way. I think actually I just say press the A and it showed like all the engine variations, which yeah, is not what I had planned. Uh, but if black does go g6, what do you think would be the move white would play here? Uh, let me know in the comments below what you think the best move for white is in this position, and we will return to it at the end of the video. Wow, already at 14 minutes, but okay, this will ensure that you yeah, are fully prepared to play uh, play free bishop f4 in your own games. I mean, the game itself is so beautiful, it's worth going deeper into it, right? So after king f8, white castles long, very nice move. Um, technically, knight d4 does... Actually, no, it doesn't regain the pawn, because they do have rook takes h4 in reply. Of course, I have knight d4 being to discover an attack on the rook. But castling is better, because, you know, the rook is not really doing a lot anyway. The knight is kind of covering it. Uh, you never really have to fear moves like bishop h4 in these sorts of positions, just as a general principle, because it just helps open up the files to attack their king. Uh, plus, the pin is also pretty annoying after rook h1, which black can't really get out of easily. 
So black goes queen d5. And yeah, Giri is trying to be creative here, like rook f8 is an attempt to... Actually, a very clever idea that if white were to take the rook, this would actually be a big mistake, because now after bishop e6, it's white whose king is now coming under a very strong attack. So you don't want to be greedy and take the material, but better just to play bishop e4 as Nihal did. Um, maybe the best practical try is actually to sack the queen just to, you know, try and stabilize the position and get some swindling chances. Of course, if white plays correctly, you'll still win this, but I know from a human perspective, at times it can be a little bit tricky to play with the queen against the pieces, especially if the pieces coordinate. So it might have been, in retrospect, a better attempt to, you know, try and turn the game around. But to play this, you sort of also have to realize that black is just dead lost at this point, and that's maybe not the, the most obvious thing yet. But after queen b3 and Nihal's move knight d2, well, now it starts to become more apparent how things are going wrong for black, because... If you do try to keep the queen safe, like queen b6, for example, well, I mean, we can even just take queen h5 and, you know, we're just basically killing the black king at this point. So the game ended d3, takes knight d4, queen to e3, queen a4, and again, we don't want to rush with bishop f5 because the rook is not really doing anything anyway. With knight c4, Nihal is threatening a monster fork on b6. Knight c2 is kind of a desperation after bishop c2, queen c4. Very nice final move by Nihal Sarin, bishop to h6. Black can't actually take the bishop because then he gets mated with uh, with rook g8. As we see here, the black king is not able to get away. And in the game after king e6, rook g7. Once more, there's no good defense to rook g8, and this is why black just resigned here. So to conclude, bishop f4 is actually quite a tricky move. It does... Well, if we take the score in the Leechus Opening Explorer, um, let's just make it two 500-plus games to give a bit of a clear indication. Wow, well, it's actually scoring like a 53% win rate in the Leechus uh, Opening Database. And yeah, if you're including draws as well, doing some quick math, it actually comes to a 58% score for White, which at this level is absolutely insane. So in short, I think Bishop F4 is a very annoying anti-Nimso, and I have a feeling that you'll have very good results of it, potentially even against very strong players if you do play it as a sort of surprise weapon. Like, if you play it every single game, I mean, someone is going to you know, just flick on their engine and, you know, black will be fine. But, you know, we can see even some of the very best players in the world have struggled against this line. So I wish you luck playing Bishop F4 in your own games. Uh, oh, actually, before I finish the video, the puzzle answer is that if they play G6, we have Rook takes G6 and we just win a pawn. But if they take, well, then they lose two pawns because of the, the fork. So that was the answer to the puzzle, and I'll see you guys in the next training video.